all the way up to here. The gentleman next to the camp, yes? On the balcony, yes? Yeah. Please. One, was your choice of the name Ezekiel a biblical illusion? And uh, second, um, the greatest Shakespeare film I, uh, I've ever seen is your filming of, uh, of Lear in 1971, I think it was. And I just wanted to know how the, the suggestions or, or prescripts of the theater of cruelty or Toad's um, theory influenced your editing of, uh, of Lear, because I watched it recently and I've read it recently and I noticed, I noticed um, the, the, the pattern of editing going on and I was wondering if there was anything related to uh, the theory of, of the theater of cruelty in that editing. So the question is, Ezekiel, does it have any biblical significance? And was the theater, of your work with the theater? Did Ezekiel, does the name Ezekiel in, in The Prisoner have any, was chosen for any biblical significance, and? No. No. <laughs> there are no secret, sly hints <laughs> to university professors and students <laughs> in the way we do a play. No, this, Maria Lynn actually used this name in one of her early versions, and that seemed to be right. Mabuza was, in fact, a young actor. His name stayed with us because we met him and saw him several times during apartheid in the middle of South Africa. But these are just names that stay with us. But there's no symbolism and, above all, no theory behind it. <laughs> One's not. Theater is not there to sell something or to illustrate any dogma or idea or theory. That is the difference between theater and politics, <laughs> where every politician has to be a really beautifully trained actor with the difference that a stage actor knows before he goes on the stage that the words he's about, or she, forgive me, the words that they're about to use are fiction. They're not their own words. But their job is to make them so real that at the moment of performance, no one's saying, who's this guy trying to persuade him? At that moment, it's real. And that's where the difference and the similarity with politics but if you want to succeed in politics anywhere, you have to be an actor, but you have lies that you want the people to believe, and your job is to find how you can find the words, the look in your eyes, the pauses, so that when you say what you know people want to hear, if I'm elected, you will see that this social evil will disappear. Here, this will approve. I'm taking this on myself. Everyone knows that what they're promising is impossible, <laughs> and they know it better than anyone themselves, but they're good actors, and I'm ashamed for the process of actors to put the two together. <laughs> actors on a stage are trying to share something that means something to them and the audience in the same way, but not to sell something that will make them bigger and more important. That is something that's belonged to the old touring actor, <laughs> where it was all a great and often splendid ego trip. <laughs> but today, the actor needs for themselves and for the audience to try to touch something that's hidden in human nature and which suddenly comes to life for us. The second part of the gentleman's question was about the, the theater of cruelty experiments and 
work that you did influence the filming of Lear? Now, everything, of course. Every single moment influences something that we can never form. The theater of cruelty, we just used this name because at that time, Anthony Artaud was a very, very considerable, brave, courageous person putting into question so much of the theater form. And as I was fortunate enough to have in the Royal Shakespeare Theater something unique, which was the possibility of having a little tiny group of our own, where we had no obligation to produce results for a long time, and we just named this because of Arto being such a brave pioneer, theater of cruelty. But theater of cruelty is not a theater to do grand guignol show, horror shows. He said very clearly, in the theater of cruelty, there is only one person who has to accept that he can be very cruel, and that is myself. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, but King Lear is another ball game. <laughs> um, this gentleman down here, who's standing in the white shirt. Hi. Uh, I want to go back to what Mr. Horowitz brought up earlier about the concept of redemption. Do you think redemption is achieved when the prisoner forgives himself, or when the society accepts the prisoner is no longer a prisoner? Uh, so in a way, I'm asking, do you think redemption in an objective way or subjective way? It's an interesting question. How can one separate the subjective and the objective? One must try to, absolutely rightly. What one can say here is, <coughs> The prisoner, and that's very clear in the, at a certain moment, is told that this was a very, very strong challenge to know that he could get up and walk away at any moment, and he is accepting this, and all this time he is looking into himself and seeing and discovering in the complexity that every one of us is shades and shades that he's never suspected. Then his uncle comes to him, Ezekiel, and says, now a new process has begun in which whatever you're doing, if you're talking, walking, eating, washing, sleeping, you're carrying the prison inside yourself so that it's no longer the outer prison. It is looking within yourself. And then in the story, the outer prison happens to be destroyed. But at the end of the play, it's very clear that this isn't, redemption's a dangerous word. Each one has to forgive deeply things in themselves. But that doesn't mean, and remorse is something very powerful for us, but that doesn't mean that once off the hook, <laughs> the sincere person, and sincere is a terrible objective demand on us all, but if one really feels this demand, and in place of sincere, we say just to be honest, honest with others, honest with ourselves, that must stay as long as there is the breath of life in a person, and it's there till the moment when there is no longer breath until that dying moment. But nobody says, I know that by the time I reach my deathbed, I will have repaid, redeemed, repaired. No, this is a more and more demanding Redemption has no end. It's just a more and more demanding carrot in front of the donkey that we are.
understood at the time that you were instructed by Mr. Gurdjieff to release that film at that time. And I wonder if um, Gurdjieff's idea about objective art and the timing of this uh, performance and this, this work uh, has a special meaning for this moment in our, in our world. What is the uh, meaning for you of, of redemption at this time? The things that one must keep very clearly and honorably separate that what Gurdjieff brought with him. And when I encountered this teaching, to me it really was, in the way that we're talking about Shakespeare, touching on every aspect of human existence in the way that remarkable people appear in history again and again. And for our time, what Gajif brought in his writings and above all in his direct working with the pupils closest to him was something that I would be cheapening. I would go away with a feeling of shame if I tried to give some neat little answer in talking about him. That is really a completely different thing, but we made those film meetings with remarkable men, not to give an answer, but to give a taste of what it could be for a very young man to feel that there are questions that he has to struggle through all his life. <coughs> and in fact, the end of meetings with remarkable men, again, is not of him finding, but if you look at his books and his last <coughs> book, you see that right to the end of his life, he was renewing more and more deeply, more and more with his travels, <coughs> with his meetings with other people, deepening what he could then share and communicate to those who became his pupils. I am fortunately never had the opportunity of meeting him. He had, I think he died just <coughs> one or two years before I first heard about this very extraordinary teaching, but that's all I can say about it today. One more question. One more question, please. Uh, the lady in the back, yes, up in the back here. Hi, thank you. I actually have two more questions, if that's okay, or just one? Well, let's see. Um, well, my first question actually uh, pertains to one of the questions that was asked in the play, as what is it that is to be repaired? Like, I am here to repair. So what exactly would be the answer to that question if that question should be answered? And my second question has to do with the amount of silence that exists in this play. And I was very curious as to what um, you wanted to do with this element in particular, or if you wanted it to have a certain effect on the audience, or rather, or rather, how we should think about watching this play in the silence that exists. The first, the first part is what is being repaired, and the second is how did you use in the telling of a story silence. How did you employ silence in the, in the performance, in the telling of the story? Well, I'll start with that because it's very simple. In everything that we knew, and I found this over the years and years, having started with a tremendous excitement of every young person, feeling that everything must be tried, and then gradually, that's all that life experience can bring you, you eliminate. That, in fact, is not my word. Gordon Craig was asked, what is your method after he'd worked all his life in finding new architectures, new shapes, new ways of using this new thing called light? What could this bring into the theater? 
and he was asked, what is your way of work? And he just said, elimination. <laughs> when I write, I write at great speed and pour out, as I'm doing now today, I hope this isn't going to be printed, but <laughs> I'm using infinitely too many words. If it were printed and I had to correct it, I could eliminate oh, at least half if not more, of every comment that I'm making. But this is spontaneous, and it's the first step, and then comes this, for us to find the set here. This is not the same in every space, but the basic ele elements are, but the, the relationship between that rock, that stone, that, and in this theatre, the beautiful depth, which isn't the whole of it, the stage, but just that depth that we have there gave us a structure in which we could put, try, and gradually eliminate, so that then what is it all about? It's about evoking something in the imagination. And the imagination can't deal with too much clutter. There's no space then for imagination. And that's it's a process and a very delicate one. And what was the other? The, the, what is being repaired? Ah, that's a very interesting question. There was somebody, when we were in New Haven a week ago, who in fact asked Marie Hélène that question. And he was a man who spoke about his spirit. He was very, very sensitive to having a spirit in him, a soul. And she said that we look at ourselves and we see how much we want to eliminate, how much we must. And this man was so touched, he went away. That means that even a soul can be repaired. Now that I just leave this for everyone because it is very much a question that's so intimate that we can't discuss it. But always this very everyday workmanlike word, which is what's good about the words that really bring us right into everyday world, at the same time repair. Something has been harmed. Something needs to be, not just because redemption is, in a way, only concerned with the person themselves. I'm trying to be cured of the way. But to think that something beyond that can be on a larger, larger scale, bit by bit, and again, not because it's ever can be completely done, but this unexpected word, repair, really opens up something beyond redemption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.